Well, good morning, and I'm outside again today. It's a glorious day, and all the birds are singing their hearts out, and the whole of creation is uh, proclaiming the glory of God. So I want to join in this morning to proclaim this glorious gospel. Now, let me begin by asking you a question. Uh, for those of you who are watching or listening this morning, can you remember a time well before the internet where if you wanted to have a question answered, you couldn't just type it into a Google search engine to get the answer. You know, back in the day when I was at school, if you had some sort of obscure question that needed answering for your homework, you know, something about the details of a foreign country or some weird animal or something that happened in history, the only way to get that answer was actually to travel to your local library and look for a book on the subject. Now, just think about that for a moment. You know, today I can pick up my smartphone and get an answer to those sort of questions within seconds. But before the digital age, to track down such information would have taken you hours. Now that was certainly the case for our family back in about 1976, when suddenly one day, an answer to all of our problems appeared at our front door in the form of a traveling salesman, who said that he had something to sell us that would in effect bring the local library to us. Now he wasn't a time traveler from the future who had come to 1976 with a mobile phone, not that it would have worked, of course, but what he did have with him was a full set of the World Book Encyclopedia, a collection of books that was nothing short of a fountain of knowledge that would ensure that any question we children ever had would be able to find right in our own front room. Well, this guy must have been a good salesman, you know, because he got past my mum, which most farmers never did, and he was ushered into the front room with his large box of books. And in my memory, what happens next is a little bit of a blur, but after all these years, two things still stand out. Firstly, this guy had us wrapped around his little finger within 10 minutes because he made these books sound so amazing. You know, he took us around the world with amazing facts and pictures and maps and graphs, and, and these books were going to transform our lives with the information they held, and especially the educational prospects of us children. I mean, he was doing such a great job uh, at selling their value to us as a family that it quickly became clear to us children that mum and dad would obviously be neglecting their duty as parents to almost the point of criminality if they didn't immediately purchase these books. Note to the wise here, never let your children sit in on a sales presentation. <laughs> anyway, it didn't seem like it would take much persuasion as mum and dad looked as enthralled as the rest of us were about the idea of us being transformed into geniuses overnight. The second thing I remember about that event was the way the atmosphere in the room suddenly changed when the salesman was asked the inevitable question, how much will this cost us? On hearing the answer, I think my father needed, needed to be worked with nearly, you know. I, I can't remember the figure, but even to our young ears, we recognized this guy was talking about a king's ransom. Now, my mum and dad are extremely polite people, so although I can't remember how they actually ushered this man out, I am sure they convinced him that they would give his offer every consideration and be in touch. <laughs> Unfortunately for mum and dad, the damage was already done. Their children had caught a glimpse of the brave new world of great prospects that lay before us, and we weren't about to let mum or dad forget what we had seen and heard. Now, in response to all of our questions, we were told that Dad would make the decision and let us know. And as far as our young minds were concerned, that couldn't take so long, could it? I mean, what could be difficult about making a decision like that? Well, as it turned out, we were about to discover that this, a decision is only easy when someone else has to make it, not you. Dad turned the tables on us. He gathered us together and announced that for the cost of those encyclopedias, we could actually buy a new TV. Wait for it, a color TV. And so he was leaving the choice up to us children. Which did we want more, a set of encyclopedias or a color TV? <laughs> you know, when I look back on it now, I find it hard to believe that any parent would actually think their children would choose books over a new TV. Maybe dad wanted a color TV for himself, I'm thinking, all along. And he saw an opportunity to get us to make that decision for him. Or maybe he just wasn't good at making those sorts of decisions. You know, he really mustn't have been because in the end, 
he went for the option that made the most people happy. He bought both. <laughs> and so for years, the complete set of the World Book Encyclopedia sat proudly on the shelf in our TV room and remained largely untouched while we all gathered around the color TV each night. And as a testimony to how untouched, I actually have the whole set still here in the house. Here's some of them. And you can see how they've largely survived uh, intact for 45 years. I now have them in my own home. What a great memory. Now, the reason I told you that story this morning is that increasingly in recent years, when I've watched the way the gospel is commonly presented to people, I have thought of that salesman. Think of how he must have felt going from door to door, knowing that no matter how good his presentation was, no matter how much he managed to convince any family that he had really good news for them, there would always come a moment when he would have to break the bad news to them. That in order to benefit from the good news, they were going to have to pay for it. Yes, it was good news, but not for everyone, only for those who could pay the price. Yes, his product was good, but he was offering this goodness at a price. Now, I know why that salesman worked so hard on his presentation. His only hope at making a sale was that his presentation would be so good that it would convince at least some people to spend what they probably didn't have to purchase it. Such a salesman then would have to be very articulate. He would have to be a great communicator. He would need to know those books, his product, back to front to be able to convincingly answer any objections or questions people might have. Now, what, have I, what I have just described to you is the reason, I think, why many believers feel totally inadequate to share the gospel. Because we have grown up with the idea that the way that salesman made his presentation is also the way the gospel must be presented. Tell him the good news and then tell him the price. You too can avail of this good news if you are willing to pay the price. All of what God has done for you, all of his resources can be yours if you in exchange will provide him with what he needs from your resources. God's salvation, his very life, he will give to you if you will repent and believe. God's done his part, so now you need to do yours. In other words, yes, it's good news, but at a price. And the price you must pay is to repent and believe. Now, this presentation of the gospel is so endemic that right now you are thinking, but Phelan, that is the gospel, isn't it? People need to repent and believe in Christ as their Savior in order to be saved. In order to avail of his amazing offer of salvation, they need to do something themselves. They need to repent and believe, right? Wrong. Listen again to what I just said. In order to receive salvation, people need to do something themselves. They need to repent and believe. You see, here's the problem. When I just said that, most believers listening did not hear anything wrong in that statement because for years, that is the way the gospel has been presented to us, as if repentance and belief are what God requires people to do themselves. In other words, we present the gospel as if repentance and belief is what God is expecting you to come up with yourself, as if repentance and belief are of ourselves. Now, what I want to show you this morning is that despite the impression our preaching leaves the world with, the gospel does not say that God has done his part and now men and women must do their part and provide repentance and belief. If repentance and believing were something that we could provide of ourselves, then we could boast in our salvation. We could look down our nose at the world and judge them as somehow less than us because they have not done what we did by ourselves, repent and believe. There's only one problem, church. We didn't repent and believe by ourselves, did we? Were we not saved in the same way the Apostle Paul was? Listen to how he described our salvation to the Ephesians from chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. How can we leave the world with the impression that we repented and believed by ourselves when the very faith that enabled us to do that is not of ourselves, but was given to us as the gift of His grace? Christian, 
you did nothing by yourself. Because in the words of Jesus, apart from him, apart from his grace, his spirit, we can do nothing. That's John 15 verse 5. You see, God is not expecting people to come up with repentance and faith in Christ by themselves. Because by themselves is the very condition that they are perishing from. Let me say that again. God is not expecting people to come up with repentance and faith in Christ by themselves because by themselves is the very condition they are perishing from. You know, God forbid, but if you were drowning in a river and cried out for someone to save you and I came along and stood there on the riverbank just shouting instructions to you on what you needed to do to save yourself, would that have been what you had in mind when you cried out for a saviour? Do you want someone who stands back from you giving advice, telling you to repent from drowning? Or do you want someone who puts himself between you and what is killing you, who unites his body with yours in order to save you? You know, when that encyclopedia salesman had finished his presentation, there was nothing more he could do for us. We were left by ourselves to come up with the resources needed ourselves to avail of what was being offered to us. Now, for the vast majority of people hearing that presentation, that being left by themselves with no help meant that they had no choice but to decline what was being offered. That salesman's presentation was wonderful, but it had no power to change our state, our by ourselves state. By the time he finished his presentation, we were in the same state he found us, by ourselves, and he was looking to us and us alone for the power, the resources, the money, to receive what he was offering. In other words, that salesman's presentation, no matter how much it first sounded like good news to us, in the end, it only pointed us to ourselves as our hope. Despite the impression you've been left with all your life, that is not a description of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not powerless to change your state. In fact, in the words of the Apostle Paul, it is the power of God unto salvation. You see, in the gospel is the power to take you out of the by-yourself life and into the with-God life. Because in the gospel itself is the power to repent and believe. That power is nothing less than the faith of Jesus Christ that comes by hearing the gospel. The gospel that points you to him as your saviour, not the one that points you to you as your saviour. The gospel that reveals a God who gives himself totally to us, who came to us and united his body with ours in our sin and death, not a God who stands back from us until we swim a bit closer to the bank. As Jesus said, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware any presentation about God that leaves your hope on yourself, because down that road lies only despair or hypocrisy. No matter how wonderful a presentation that salesman did, he left us as he found us, by ourselves. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say next. Believer, church, when we present the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is the power present not to leave people by themselves, but to bring them into an experience of Emmanuel, God with us. That power is his very presence in our lives. Let me rephrase that to be more biblically accurate. That power is his life. When you stand and proclaim the gospel, his life is present. The people you're speaking to are in the presence of God. For do you not carry the presence of God? Are you not the temple of the Holy Spirit? Are you not the very living proof before them of what you are saying? Did Jesus not say that when you and I as believers draw near the men and women of this world, we can declare to them that the very kingdom of God has drawn near them? The body of Christ can proclaim what the head proclaimed. And if we look at what Jesus proclaimed, it was, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is his rule and reign, his presence. Can you hear what we are asked to proclaim to people? Repent, for the presence of God is here. Can you see it yet? God never expected people to repent, apart from the power of his kingdom. He didn't separate repent from the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, the two always go together. He never expected people to repent apart from his presence. He never expected people to repent by themselves. He never expected you to swim to the bank so that he could pull you out. He never expected you to save yourself. 
Jesus never expected people to repent by themselves. In fact, his full instruction to his disciples in Luke 9, as he sent them out, was to proclaim the kingdom of God and demonstrate it by healing the sick. In other words, don't just tell people God is drawn near them. Be God drawing near them. Don't stand back from people issuing them instructions on how to get out of their darkness. Be the light that dispels their darkness. Be the presence of God drawing near them. God's way to bring men and women to repentance is to draw near them by his presence. For it is not possible for a man to repent apart from the Spirit of God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3. No man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. If men and women cannot repent apart from the presence of God, can you see that Christ's purpose in bringing a Spirit-filled, a God-filled life, His body, His church, into the earth, was not so that we can shout at this world from our ivory towers to repent, but so that we can be the very presence of God living in their midst, apart from which they cannot repent. No wonder the church is exhorted to be being filled with the Spirit of God. For it is as we live in the reality, the truth of the power and the presence of God, that God through our lives, our words, is giving people himself, his presence. That's what Philemon verse 6 means when it says, the sharing of your faith becomes effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The more we acknowledge the abundance of his grace, his life toward us and in us, the more we are filled to overflowing with the presence of God and his presence shining out of us causes men's eyes to open to the darkness they've been living in. For only the truth, God with us, dispels the darkness of the lie that God left us by ourselves. Jesus never expected people to find their way out of darkness by themselves. He has placed his life, the light of men, in us, his church. And he now declares to us, you are the light of the world. Don't complain about the darkness. Let your light shine. Let my life in you and your life in me so shine with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control in all circumstances that people repent of not believing in Emmanuel. For in seeing you, they'll be seeing Emmanuel, God with us. Now you and I in the church in general may be forever drawing back from that truth of our union with him. But Christ does not. For if you remember from Jesus' prayer of John 17, this union is the very reason he came, that they may all be one, he said, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, while you and I in the church in general are busy religiously trying our best to appear separate ourselves from God and claim that we're still mere men and women who committed ourselves to follow Jesus, from a respectable distance, of course. The testimony of Jesus is saying quite the opposite. He doesn't see you as stepping out with him. Sorry to break it to you, but he's going around telling everyone that he married you. And that as far as he is concerned, his death and resurrection did exactly what he intended it to do. Believer, you are now in him, just as he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. It's a bit late, church, to be acting like you need to get yourself cleaned up more in the hope that he's going to pay a visit to your house. Didn't you get the memo? You weren't capable of cleaning yourself up. So he took care of that by his blood. And as we've already seen, if you can confess Jesus as Lord this morning, you can only do that because his Holy Spirit has already moved into your house. If you will just lift your eyes out of the earthly religious realm, where men still think they have the power by themselves to be as he is, and set them instead on things above, you will see what all of heaven can see, that you're married to him. And just as a husband and wife are in one flesh, all who are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That's 1 Corinthians six seventeen. For your old single life died, and you are now hidden with Christ and God. That's Colossians 3, verse 3. This truth is why Jesus was able to say to Saul of Tarsus when he persecuted the church, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You see, Jesus sees himself and his body as one. And I'm sorry to trample on your religious sensibilities this morning, but he actually believes that we are now one in the same way that he walked this earth as a man, so in communion with the Spirit of God that he could say, when I speak, it is the Father's words you're hearing. You know, I think the more that we begin to see 
to perceive by the Spirit the one life, the union we partake of with Him, then the more our words will be His words, and the more we will see the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven on the earth. For when He speaks, life comes. Can you see what I'm saying? The power for the world to repent and believe is the presence of God drawing near. So what the world needs is not more instructions from us on how to repent by themselves, but they need us, the church, to be so full of the presence of God that their eyes are opened to Emmanuel, God with us. I think many times of the Apostle Peter entering into the house of Cornelius and making a presentation of the gospel before Gentiles, non-Jews, for the first time. And I don't know how much Peter thought about uh, what he was going to have to say or how many words he was going to have to speak uh, before he could convince those Gentiles to repent and believe in Christ. But as it turned out, he didn't get to speak for very long at all. Within minutes of him opening his mouth, all those people had repented and believed because they found themselves in the presence of God. For to be in the presence of a man or woman filled with the Spirit of God is to be in the presence of God. I'll say that again. To be in the presence of a man or woman filled with the Spirit of God is to be in the presence of God. And that's why we see in the book of Acts that when God wanted a city or a region to experience His presence, He simply sent Spirit-filled men and women into that city. He didn't ask His church to pray that His presence would go into that city. He sent men and women filled with His presence into that city, for He knew that people cannot repent by themselves apart from the presence of God. Now, could God sovereignly show up in a place in power causing multitudes to repent and believe without his church? Of course he could. But in Christ, he has gone beyond doing everything for us, for his heart was always to do everything with us. And that is why Emmanuel came, God with us, for he never intended that we would attempt to do anything by ourselves. You know, even back then, the early church, with their old covenant mindset, couldn't help thinking of repentance as a work of the flesh as something people had to do themselves for God before they could know Emmanuel, God with us. Peter, after that meeting in Cornelius' house, you know, he was hauled before the leadership of the church in Jerusalem and asked for an explanation as to why he had baptized Gentiles. Why hadn't he waited to see if they would repent first in the way the church thought repentance should look like? For surely only after they had properly repented should they have been given baptism the public sign of God's acceptance and their new birth. But, said Peter, how could I have refused them if God accepted them? He gave them his spirit, his presence, and in his presence they repented. When faced with the generosity of God, the early church leaders fell silent. And I love what Acts 11 verse 18 says. When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has also granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. You see, repentance is granted. It's gifted by God. Why? Because repentance is not something God ever expected men and women to produce by themselves. It is given to them by the power of His presence. And because God desires that all men should repent, He has sent out His presence, His church, into all the world. For when we draw near to people, His very presence is drawing near to them and gifting to them the repentance that leads to life. Let me put that another way. The gospel is not that if you repent, then God will give himself to you. The gospel is that far from God withholding himself from you, he is in this moment freely giving himself to you, and in his giving is the power for you to have your eyes open to see him, to see his life given to you, Christ. And in seeing him, your mind will undergo a total metanoia, an about face, a repentance from living as if you have been left by yourself to living in his presence, living in Emmanuel, God with us. God doesn't expect anyone to turn around to repent apart from his presence. That is why he is giving himself away freely and the vessel through which he has chosen to freely pour himself out is his church. But how good are we at freely giving his presence? only as good as we are at freely receiving his presence. Listen to the words that Jesus said to those disciples in Luke 9 before sending them out with a power to proclaim his kingdom. He said, freely you have received, freely give. 
In every generation where communities are not being brought to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, it is not that God has somehow decided not to give them himself because this generation somehow is any worse than previous ones. Rather, it is because the church has stumbled over freely giving his presence because she has forgotten how to freely receive his presence. Let me say that again. We can only freely give what we have freely received. The biggest reason the church hesitates to freely give the presence of God and instead starts to draw back from the world and shout instructions at them from a distance on how to repent is because she has been hesitating to freely receive the presence of God herself and has instead yoked herself again to a culture of church works that we think necessary if we are to persuade God to give us more of his presence. Can I let you into a little cigarette that will change your life? You can't make God a better giver. You can't make God a better giver. But you know, if you sit in an old covenant-minded transactional, if you do this for him, then he will do that for you, church culture for long enough, you will become a very poor receiver because you've become such an expert in what people need to do to get God to give them his presence that you can't even see that his presence is being freely given. And all your reasoning on how to get his presence has only blinded you to his presence. Now let me finish by showing you that in scripture, a beautiful account of how the Lord's presence freely given leads men to repentance. In Luke 24, there's a vivid description of two disciples who are walking away from the call of God in their lives, walking in the wrong direction when they meet a stranger on the road to Emmaus. Those disciples have just witnessed something which has traumatized them, disillusioned them, disappointed them, the crucifixion of Jesus. They are deeply disappointed and heartbroken that the presence of God, Christ, appears to have been withdrawn from them. And as they walk along, trying to reason out why this has happened, Jesus joins them. And we become aware that far from God's presence being withdrawn from them, he's actually freely giving himself to them, even as they're walking in the wrong direction. You see, what I've been saying this morning is that God doesn't expect people to repent and believe by themselves, apart from his presence. For this reason, he's always freely giving his presence, for it is the giving of his presence that causes the eyes of men and women to open to see him, to see Emmanuel, God with us. Earlier we saw how Jesus told his disciples to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of God draws near you. And that that very same phrase is used here now to describe Jesus drawing near the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. As he draws near to them and speaks to them, these two disciples later describe the effect on them as feeling their hearts burning within them. There is an awakening going on to the presence of God, but I want to draw your attention to the moment their eyes open. What does the scripture say was happening in the moment their eyes opened? What happened to enable them to recognize Emmanuel, God with us, that caused them to have a metanoia, a repentance, a 180 degree turnaround in the direction they were going? Listen to that scripture from Luke 24, verse 28. It says, as they approached the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going farther, they strongly urged him saying, stay with us for it is getting toward evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them and it came about when he had reclined at the table with them that he took the bread and blessed it and he broke it and began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Can you see the progression of his presence, his presence being given to them? He draws near to them in his listening. He draws near to them in his speaking. He draws near to them in his sitting with them. And he draws near to them in his giving to them. These verses say that it was as he was giving to them to eat that their eyes were opened. You see, the power to repent, to have a metanoia, comes in the giving of his presence. For it is the giving of his presence that undoes the lie that darkened our eyesight. It is the giving of the truth God with us, that brings light into the darkness the lie brought, the lie that God has left us to become like him by ourselves. Emmanuel, God with us, Christ, is the light that opens our eyes, that enables us to think from a totally new world, a world where God has not left us alone to try and become like him, 
but has given himself totally to us, a world where he is freely giving himself to us. For it is nothing less than the giving of himself to us that delivers us from darkness to light. Listen to those verses again that describe the moment the eyes of the disciples were opened to recognize Jesus, to see God with us. He took the bread and blessed it, and he broke it and began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. You know, recently as I read those verses, there was something familiar about that phrase that something was given to them to eat and as they received it, their eyes were opened. Where had I heard that phrase before? And then I remembered. That is the very phrase that is used of what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve offered Adam the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And listen to what happens next from Genesis 3, verse 6 and 7. She also gave some to her husband with her, and he yet. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Is it not amazing that when Jesus gives his presence to those disciples, their eyes are open to see Emmanuel, God with us. But when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the self-effort tree, when they ate of the lie that God had left them to become like him by themselves, their eyes could no longer see past themselves. Suddenly, all they could see was that they were naked. They fell from the light of God consciousness into the darkness of self-consciousness. They fell from being to becoming, from communion to religion, self-effort. Now in their believing, and so in their being, they had cut themselves off from God. For in believing the lie that they could become like God by themselves, they had literally come to believe in themselves as if they could produce life by themselves. God is not expecting people to come up with repentance and faith in Christ by themselves, because by themselves is the very condition that they're perishing from. Church, let's not stand back from this world and shout at them to repent. Let's not stand on the riverbank shouting advice at them while they drowned, for that is not what he did for us. He dived in, into the raging waters. He put himself between us and what was killing us, he united his body with ours in order to save us from the condition from which we were perishing, the condition called by ourselves. Don't offer men and women the knowledge of good and evil as if they by themselves have the power to become good. Give them the tree of life. Give them the truth, Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Let his presence draw near them through your life, for it is through the giving of himself to them through your life that he now grants them repentance unto life and their eyes to open, that they may repent and believe in him. Freely you have received, so freely give. Dare to believe in the generosity of God to you, that he has not withheld his very presence from you, and let his generosity in your life, the overflowing abundance of his Spirit in you, lead men to repentance. But how clearly can the world see through our lives that God is freely giving? only to the degree that we, the church, are freely receiving. For we cannot freely give what we're not freely receiving. How do we know when we as believers, as the church, have lost sight of how freely he gives? We find ourselves in prayer trying to persuade God to be a better giver. We find ourselves such experts in what people need to do to get God to give us presence that we can't even see anymore that his presence is being freely given and all our reasoning on how to get his presence has only blinded us to his presence. All those years ago, that encyclopedia salesman studied his set of books and practiced what he was going to say in order to convince us of the truth of what he was saying. But in the end, he left us by ourselves. There is nothing wrong with studying the book or knowing how to answer questions, but church, we have been given his very spirit his life, the very presence of God, so that when we present the gospel, people are not left to repent and believe by themselves. Instead, through our lives, they encounter the God who is freely giving himself to them and saving them from the very condition from which they are perishing, a condition called by themselves. God bless you.
Well, thanks for watching today. And if you really felt something spoke to you today or touched you, feel free to get in touch. And you can do that by just searching River City Church Ireland on Facebook or on YouTube. And I just really believe that as you're just listening to these messages, that something is changing in your life because the Word of God never returns to Him void. God bless you.